Chapter Five of the Man Who Fought the Devil by Eva K. Betts. Chapter Five. Aside from the welcome he might have expected from his mother, Jean Marie would not have believed any one would receive him with such kind warmth as Mrs. Fayot showed. Sick, bewildered, unhappy recruit Vianney was swept into the hearts of Claudine and her children. He was put to bed, cared for tenderly, nursed back to health again. As his strength returned, he took stock of his situation. Without ever intending it, he had become a deserter. He was an exile from his family, a man outside the law. Yet to give himself up now would be to risk the safety of all the people who had been so kind to him. And, too, he considered the fact that his call to the army was the result of an error on the part of Father Bailey. It would be best, he decided, to leave things as they were. He began a strange life, hiding in the barn most of the day, coming out only after dark had fallen. His emergence was always eagerly awaited, especially by the smaller Fayette children, for when he entered the house, story hour began. He told stories from the Old Testament and the New, the lives of the saints and legends about them. He read passages from the Bible each night, much to Mrs. Fayette's delight. Since her husband's death, there had been no one in the house who could read. By March, a more normal way of life was possible for Jean Marie. He took the name Jerome Vincent and was introduced as a cousin of the Fayots and with this new name and new identity, he could go out in public once more. It was safe even to go to Mass on Sunday, a privilege for which he had been longing. The townspeople, completely unsympathetic with the Emperor's grandiose plans, did not inquire too closely when a new cousin appeared in the household of one of the neighbors, and if they noticed that the guests were all males and much of the same age, they never commented on the coincidence. Jerome Vincent soon established a little school in the Fayot home, at first it was meant only for the children of the household, but when the neighbors learned that the young Fayots were learning not only to read, but also something about their religion, for Jean-Marie used the prayer book as a textbook, children from all the surrounding farms were sent to the classes. It was not long, in fact, before young and even older men began drifting into the school. The language Jean-Marie used was simple. His own education had been sketchy, but he seemed to have something in him which reached out to his hearers. To each, whether child or man, the words seemed a message meant just for him. Through the month of March the classes continued. In April the snows melted, and the earth was ready for turning and seeding. Jean Marie had had enough of life indoors, and now that it was safe for him to be seen, he took up a spade and joined the men working in the fields. Hello, the schoolmaster is joining us. Although by now he was very popular with the people of Robins, the men smiled at the thought of the frail-looking schoolmaster doing heavy work. But when he threw off his coat and began digging, the men saw that he was no novice at the job, and that experience made up for lack of brawn. And as he proved that he was able and willing to do his part in the manual labor of the place, the affection in which he was held became even stronger. His classes, moved to the evening hours now that preparation for crops filled the days, became larger and larger. Men came at first out of respect for the young man. They continued to come because of the information and the guidance he gave them. The people of the settlement of Robbins and of the town of Noez were proud of Teacher Jerome, and determined that he should stay with them, that he should not waste his youth and perhaps his life in army service. Since the police were aware that the woods around Noez were full of deserters, they sent out search parties at intervals. The searchers were rather half-hearted in their efforts, did not exert themselves too much, but when they drew in their nets they usually had a few young men. In order that Jean-Marie should not be included in any of these captures, self-appointed sentries along the various roads leading to the Fayot farm watched for searchers. When a group of police rode past, a child was sent flying across the fields with a warning. One hot day in July, a red-faced, panting lad rushed to the fields where the Fayots were haying. They come! The men looking for soldiers are coming! Run to the house, Jerome. You know where to hide, called Mrs. Fayot. Not the house, warned her son. The soldiers will see him as they come down the hill. To the barn, then. You go with him, Jean, she said to her own son. Take him up into the haymow and fork a good pile of hay over him. The two young men ran. Claudine kept the neighbor's child with her and thrust her son's hay fork into his hands. Work, she directed. Look busy. Jerome's fork she took herself and set to work with vigor. Good day, called a voice from the road. We are looking for deserters from the Emperor's army, 
and we are going to search your farm. Search my farm? Why should you do that? Mrs. Fayot tried to keep her voice steady. We have told you. But there is... We are searching your farm, madam. You and your son remain here. I am not... The young messenger had been bewildered enough when pressed into work with the hay-fork, but now that he was being counted as son in a family not his own, he started to protest. A sharp glance from Mrs. Fayot silenced him. You are not what? asked the soldier suspiciously. The little boy suddenly understood the situation. I am not going to stay here in the sun, he said, pouting. I am going to wait there in the shade of the hedgerow, if you do not object, that is. All right, you both may go over there. It's farther from the house, anyway. The soldiers wheeled their horses and rode toward the farm buildings. The house was so small and so sparsely furnished that a few minutes' casual search satisfied them no one was concealed there. Then they went to the barn. "'Who's there? What do you want?' Joel and Fayot stepped out of the cold dark of the barn and shaded his eyes against the sun. "'Police, looking for deserters.' "'Come right along, if you must. You won't mind if I keep on with my work.' The handle of my hoe is broken, and I'm putting a rivet in it. Go right ahead. You won't disturb us. Jean Fayot seated himself on the great grain chest and went calmly on with his task. The soldiers tramped around the barn, searching in dark corners and behind piles of lumber. Try the hay mow, directed the leader. Jean Fayot smiled a little and moved to seat himself more securely on the chest. One of the soldiers noticed the smile and spoke to the officer in charge. Come down. He ordered the men who were climbing the ladder to the hamo, search that chest. They descended and walked over to Jean Fayot. Get off there, they ordered. There is nothing in here but grain, he said, continuing his work. Off, the order was sharp and angry. You're wasting your time, said Jean Fayot. But as the determined men moved toward him, he slipped from his perch and stood watching. The police moved toward the grain bin, and one took hold of each end of the heavy lid which covered it. The officer in command and a companion stood back, ready to seize the man they expected to leap out and make a break for safety. The lid was thrown back. The chest was full of grain. "'You see, I spoke the truth,' said Jean Fayot, suppressing a smile. "'Fortunately for you,' the leader of the police was embarrassed and angry. "'Come, we're wasting time here. We'll go to the forest and do our hunting there.' The clatter of hoofs in the stable yard drowned out a mighty sneeze from the hamo above. Jean Fayette looked out of the barn door and saw that the police were now on the high road and hurrying away from the house. He quickly ascended the ladder and began tossing the great heap of hay to one side. "'It's fortunate you held back that sneeze,' he said. "'If it had come a few minutes earlier, you'd be in irons now.' "'I know.' The schoolmaster's face was uncovered and he was wiggling to get his arms free. "'I'd been fighting it for a long time.' He was interrupted by another sneeze. I never before realized just how dusty hay is, and I seem to have had some field mice for companions, too. Oh, I don't like this being an outlaw. Jean Fayot stopped his work. You don't like living here? It's not that, not that at all. Your mother is a second mother to me, and you are my brother. But it's such a disorderly, unnatural life I am living. I want to become a priest and teach the word of God. You are teaching, said Jean Fayot quietly. The children hereabouts know their prayers and catechism, thanks to you. And many men who hadn't been to church in years now go regularly after hearing your teaching. Yes, I know, and I'm grateful for that, agreed the schoolmaster. Months passed. By now the Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte ruled most of Europe. He had established a system of dependencies, which included so much of the continent that it was possible to travel from the Baltic Sea to Naples and never leave land controlled by France. He wanted a son to inherit this vast power, and since his wife, Josephine, had none, he divorced her and married the Archduchess Marie Louise of Austria. By this marriage, the adventurer from Corsica became allied to the oldest and proudest royal family of Europe. Napoleon ordered great celebrations all over his empire to mark his illegal marriage. There were fireworks and feasting, and as a gift to the people, he ordered an amnesty, Forgiveness for all the young men who had avoided service between the years of 1806 and 1810. So it was that, just after New Year's Day, 1811, Jean-Marie Vianney returned to his parents' home. The people of Noes and of the little settlement of Robbins hated to see him go. All loved him, and many had come to depend on the wisdom of his advice. 
He always seems able to see what the listener needs to hear, they agreed. And when they at last realized that he was really leaving them, they determined that he must do them credit when he reappeared in his own home. There was real competition among them to see who could contribute most towards sending him back in style. A cloth merchant who had some good black material on hand offered that as his share, and the Noah's tailor gave his services in making it into a soutane. Jean-Marie had to try it on and be viewed by all his friends. But your shoes! They are old and cracked and look very bad showing under your fine new soutane. The shoemaker got to work with donated leather and made a sturdy pair of boots. You will have your own parish soon, said Mrs. Fayot, and you will need. But, Mother Fayot, I am a long way from being a priest yet, let alone having a parish. You will be a priest, said Mrs. Fayot with assurance, and your table must look well when important people come to dine. Here are a dozen linen napkins, my wedding napkins. I want you to take them. Little souvenirs treasured for years came from almost every home. One woman brought a bag with three gold coins. But this is all the money you have in the world, protested Jean-Marie. I can't take this. You'll need to buy books, the woman argued, and I'll have more soon. I'm fattening a fine pig. Mrs. Vianney welcomed her son with joy almost too great to endure. His father, although happy to see him, was somewhat less enthusiastic. You gave me a hard time running away and hiding as you did, he said sternly. But I didn't run away. I've told you how it happened, father. Almost every day the recruiting officer was here. He would not believe. I did not know where you were. Mr. Vianney continued, paying no attention to Jean-Marie's protest. I was threatened with the loss of my home and all my property if I did not tell where you were. But I was sick at first. I did not realize. You got well. Then you should have joined your regiment. You gave us all a very bad time. When he saw the distress on his son's face, Mr. Vianney relented a little. It's all over now, anyway, and we are glad to have you back again. And he went on about his business. Do you think I can continue my studies? Jean-Marie asked his mother when they were alone. Oh, yes, you must. But perhaps Father Bailey... Father Bailey expects you, his mother interrupted. When we did not know where you were or what had become of you, I was so worried I was almost sick, so I went into Eccoli to talk with the good father. Jean-Marie waited eagerly. He listened patiently for a while, but then he became a little angry. Angry? With you? Yes. He said I had no confidence. Go away, he told me. I assure you that your son will be a priest. Two weeks later, Jean-Marie was back at Eccoli. This time, instead of living with his cousins, he stayed at the priest's house so that he could have constant help and direction in his studies. He was twenty-five now and knew less Latin than many boys half his age but he was more than ever determined to study and learn, to move ahead toward the priesthood. Day and night he tried to crowd the lessons into his mind, to master the Latin, which he must know if he was really to understand the lesson taught, and recite it in that language. For relaxation he worked in the rectory garden, alternately praying and reciting lessons to himself as he did so. Vegetable seeds produce vegetables, vines produce grapes, he would mourn. Everything does its duty except my stupid brain, I wonder if I will ever be able to learn all I must know. Work, and don't be proud, counseled Father Bailey. Proud? I certainly have nothing to be proud of, Jean-Marie answered. The time was coming when he would have greater lessons in humility. After Jean-Marie had been with Father Bailey about six months, the priest decided it was time for young Vianney to begin the year of philosophy, which he must take in the seminary. This was a foundation for the theological studies which would precede ordination. So Jean-Marie was sent to the minor seminary at Verrieres, a sort of preparatory school for the major seminary of St. Irene at Lyons. End of chapter 5 Recording by Maria Therese